Hey, how you doing on this cold winter Monday night? Wow, the snow has been coming down here where I am in Union City, Tennessee, and I don't know where you are, probably around here if you're watching this. I don't think we go around the world, uh, but <laughs> but uh, maybe you're in a different place. But anyway, and in a different time uh, for Today on Monday, it is cold, 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 and we're having unusual snowfall and wintry stuff going on and really unusual temperatures. This reminds me of when I was growing up in the in the 70s, we had some winters that were really bad, three in a row, as a matter of fact, 1977, 78, and 79 were terrible winters. Then this reminds me of that. Anyway, I pray that you're safe and warm, and I pray that you're all right. Uh, and that you're snug as a bug in a rug, as I used to say when I was growing up. Now, what we're going to be doing this week, we're looking at the second half of Psalm 89. As you know, the series we're doing, we took a break for Valentine's Day, but the series we're doing is talking about uh, firstborn. What does that mean? It is the forgotten title of Jesus. And we are looking at Psalm 89 because it is pivotal in understanding God's fulfillment of uh, the uh, the firstborn that he calls of Israel, and then applies that to David as Israel's representative, and ultimately how that's going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the son of David, uh, who is the promised one, uh, the anointed one, the Messiah. So we're going to be looking, we looked at the first half of, of this psalm uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I talked about this uh, section that we're going to be talking about this week, uh, I talked about part of it. Um, well, we're going to be talking about today, we're talking about the, the whole of uh, Psalm 89 and the rest of this week, but today we're talking about a part that I covered a few weeks ago, but to get us back into it, I thought I'd better cover it again, and it's Psalm 89, we're going to begin in the 19th verse, and you remember the basis of Psalm 89, the first two things that are foundational bedrock for this psalm is, one, the loving kindness of God, and two, the faithfulness of God, the uh, uh, the, the chesed and the amuna of God. The loving kindness, loving goodness, loving mercy, however you want to define that, um, it is always love behind that. It's loving kindness, loving compassion, loving mercy, however you do it. Love is involved in it. That's an attribute of God. The other one is God's faithfulness. Faithfulness to what? Faithfulness to his word. Certainly faithfulness to his covenant, but that's too limiting. It is faithfulness to his word. God can, whatever God speaks, God is faithful to because God is true. God is faithful. Uh, he will accomplish that which he says. Uh, so you can count upon his faithfulness. You can count upon his loving kindness. Neither one of them will ever go away. Uh, God cannot be untrue to himself, so his loving kindness will always be behind and involved the vehicle of and the expression of anything that God does. And then secondly, uh, his faithfulness, because God cannot be untrue to himself and cannot be false, then he must be faithful to his word. Certainly his promises, no, excuse me, to his people and to individuals. And that becomes vitally important when we think about the promises made to us through, uh, by God, through uh, faith in Jesus Christ, the promise of salvation, the promise of eternal life, those kind of things are, uh, we have security in them because of who God is, and he will accomplish what he says he will accomplish. All right, so this is going, we, we looked at it just, those two things are talked about in the first part of the psalm, uh, and then it talks about the promise to David. Uh, and then moves on from that very quickly to uh, the rejoicing of God's people. And then it comes and picks this thing up again. But those two things are important. One, God's loving kindness. Two, God's faithfulness to his word. And then it's going to talk about the covenant of David. And that's what we're going to look at today. Once you spoke in vision to your godly ones, whether it's plural or singular, there's some question. But the, the godly ones that's being talked about, of course, are the prophets of God. Uh, they that you spoke in vision to your godly ones, uh, in vision to one Samuel, in the anointing of David, uh, another Nathan, uh, who is the voice of God to speak the covenant to David, uh, and, and then from then on out, all of the prophets that speak of 
of the choosing of David, of God uh, ruling and reigning not only Israel, but the entire earth through David, through David's descendants, and then ultimately through uh, a son of David. And so that's the godly ones that are being talked about. And said, I have given help to one uh, who is mighty, a, a, a valiant man. Usually it's talked about a warrior. I have exalted one chosen from the people. Now, of course, this is talking about uh, David himself, who was taken from the people. He was the least of Jesse's sons, and uh, he, he is anointed, and then he is this warrior. He is a valiant warrior uh, for Israel. Goes out and he fights uh, Goliath when he's too young to, to even wear armor, and uh, it's is, uh, relies uh, on the faithfulness of God and is valiant for the glory of God. And, and, and uh, so he is this conqueror. He is this warrior. That's what it means, who is mighty, the mighty one. Uh, I have found David my servant. And that word means that he is a vassal king. He is a servant of Yahweh. He is, he is a king, but he is a vassal king. Uh, God, the Lord Yahweh, reigns through David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. And that, of course, in the Old Testament, typically refers to the Old Testament. Not the Old Testament. It refers to the Holy Spirit. So that uh, the Holy Spirit, and when you read the story of the anointing uh, of David, the Holy Spirit came upon David at that time and, uh, and stays with David. With whom my hand will be established. Now, that sounds strange, doesn't it? That the hand of the Lord is going to be established by David. What that means, however, is God's reign. God's authority, God's dominion is going to be established uh, through David or by David. And, but there's something that goes with that. Uh, my arm also will strengthen him, that it's by the power of God that David is going to rule and reign in the authority of God. He's going to do that. God is reigning through David and so, uh, and so that becomes important when we start thinking about the seed of David that, that, that we're going to get to in a minute. The enemy will not deceive him. That's talking about human enemies. The enemies will not overcome him, will not deceive him, will not in combat. They will not deceive him in combat. Uh, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. That, that's talking about Satan more than likely. That's usually... Uh, what that term would be used for, the deceiver, Satan himself, uh, that there will be no human force that can deceive him in combat. There will be no wickedness that can overcome him uh, that will afflict him on a continual basis. Although we know David stumbled and fell, there was repentance, there was restoration and that kind of thing. I will crush his adversaries before him and strike those who hate him. In other words, anybody that comes against David, God is going to take care of them because David has been chosen. God is reigning through David. So to strike at David is to strike at God. David is the vassal of Yahweh, and Yahweh reigns through David. He is David, in that sense, is God's representative to Israel and to the nations. Um, through David, uh, God's justice, his, his mercy, his, uh, his reign and rule and authority should be established as a, uh, to be seen. He is the, to display that. Uh, to Israel, and ultimately to the, to the nations as well. My faithfulness and my love and kindness will be with him. There again, my faithfulness, the faithfulness to his covenant, and the loving kindness of God uh, will remain with him. That will stay there. That's constant. And in my name, his horn will be exalted. In other words, his line, his authority will be lifted up. He will be established. That's what that word means. It means to lift up high. Uh, it, it is to uh, let it be seen. It's to be established, be lifted like you take a pole and lift it up. It's talking about his authority, his line, his, his reign uh, will be exalted. In what? By the name of Yahweh. In the name of Yahweh, by the power of that name. I shall also set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. And as we said before, that is talking about the Mediterranean Sea. It's also talking about um, the, either the Tigris or Euphrates River, which would be the absolute boundary um, of, of David's rule and reign. I, he will cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Uh 
so in there is a sense in which he will cry out to God as Father and God and my God and the rock of my salvation that he is the God is the one who sustains him God is the one who rescues him who delivers him that's what that word means the salvation to deliver to rescue uh, that God is the one that he depends upon for that uh, interesting we, we turn to verse 27 through 29 I also shall make him my firstborn the highest of the kings of the earth now what does it mean that he says I will make him my firstborn well, I think I said this before, but I'll say it again. Uh, there are 14 times that God is spoken of uh, as being uh, having a firstborn in the Old Testament. And of those times, it is almost always talking about Israel, that Israel is Yahweh's firstborn. He brought them forth. He establishes them. Uh, they are his firstborn. How does that apply to David? It applies to David because David is Israel's representative. So that in this sense, God says, or Yahweh says of David, that David is my firstborn because he is representing Israel. And that becomes vitally important when you get to his ultimate son, the, the seed singular of David, which is Jesus or Yeshua, which means that uh, God is salvation but it means that when, when Jesus is the firstborn, that he is Israel's representative. So that salvation is through Israel, but through Israel's faithful representative, the true son of David, the one who reigns perfectly, uh, the one who is faithful to Yahweh completely and fully. And so we're going to see that, that by the time we get to the end of this, we're going to see how that plays out. So don't let that bother you. Uh, this is supposed to be true of all of David's descendants down to the Messiah, the seed, the son of David, who is Messiah. The highest of the kings of the earth. He is going to be king of kings. My loving kindness I will keep with him forever, keep for him forever. And my covenant shall be confirmed to him. In other words, this covenant, this unconditional covenant to David that was made uh, by God to David and spoken through Nathan, if you remember that story, it was that David wanted to build uh, the house of God, the temple, and God said, no, you can't. Uh, that is for your son to do. And of course, Solomon built the physical temple. But Jesus is the one who is building the temple of Yahweh uh, through bringing people to him. And we are be built up into the temple of God. Uh, and then Nathan told him, no, God says you can't build the temple, but God is going to build a house for you. He's going to build a dynasty for you and your descendants. Your line will always continually reign, and you'll never lack having a, a descendant on the throne uh, of Israel. And so he says, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. That's the covenant that he's talking about, the promise. So I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. How long will David's throne last? as long as heaven lasts. So we're talking about eternity. Uh, and who will establish it? God will establish it. God will establish the descendants of David, and God will establish the throne of David, and it will last forever. And so that's where we get to tonight. We're talking about that covenant promise to David, and it is vital that we understand that promise. It is vital we understand because this thing is going to turn. It's going to make a hard right turn. And there's going to be all, it borders on the line, border, to me, it borders on blasphemy. I don't have the courage to talk to God uh, like whoever wrote this psalm does. Um, taking God, God to task. But you said this, and now this is what's going on. I don't get it. I don't understand. So what we are talking about in this is the crisis that often comes, a crisis of faith. And perhaps you have experienced that kind of crisis where you, God, where are you? And that's what the question always comes out. Where are you? I don't understand. You said this. I thought this. And this is what's happened. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Um, and so that's what we're looking at. D is God really lovingly kind? And is God faithful to his word? That becomes the question. And tied up with that is, one, this is non-negotiable, that God is faithful to his word. He is always lovingly kind. That's who God is. That's not negotiable. God has made promises about David and about David's descendant or the seed of David. That's not negotiable either. God has made these promises. How does that fit in with what God, who God is and what he and how he behaves uh, when we get to this later on? We're going to talk about David's sons because certainly 
God had David on the throne, and certainly Solomon was on the throne. And then things start going haywire after that, and we'll get to that tomorrow. Hey, listen, as we continue to look at this, I hope that it is a journey of faith for you as we look, because all of us come to those times of crises of faith where, where reality rubs up against our theology, our understanding of God. And when that happens, rather than doubting God, it should drive us back to God's Word to say, do I really understand that? What does God's Word really say? Um, because we need to be like the psalmist and understand that there are certain things about God that are non-negotiable. That is who he is. He is always lovingly kind. He, uh, his loving kindness is forever because that's an attribute of God. God is love. And then secondly, you can trust his faithfulness. He is faithful to his word. And so if that both of those are true, and I contend that they are, then when we have a problem with reality in our theology, then our theology must be corrected. We've got to go back to God's Word, uh, pray it through, see it through, let the Holy Spirit teach us, because obviously we haven't understood it correctly, and we need to get back to that. So I pray that on this journey we can have a, a renewed confidence in God's Word, a, a absolute confidence in God's love and His uh, and His um, his faithfulness to his word, that he carries out what he says he's going to carry out, because ultimately that has to do with what he has said to us about our salvation in Jesus Christ. And I know that you want to have confidence in that. I pray that you do. Hey, listen, I pray that you're warm. I pray that you're safe. I pray that you're not having to get out in this, this mess that's going on right now. Um, hopefully, uh, God's going to take care of us through this, and, and we're going to get through this, and there's going to be sunshine eventually, and all this is going to go away. Maybe you love snow. I personally don't. I don't like it. I don't like cold. I like to be warm. Uh, so, so maybe you're like me. I don't know. Maybe I'm rambling. Hey, listen, I, I just want you to be safe. Uh, God loves you. Uh, and he has proven that by giving his son, Jesus Christ, you might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life. And that's right, joy indescribable right here and right now, even with winter storms. I pray that that's yours. Um, hey, listen, till tomorrow, God bless you. See you tomorrow.